my name is Ramya. I'm the Director of Environmental Science at the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. Today we're going to talk about invasive species. Um, some of you may know uh, that Florida is a, a hotbed for invasive species. I'm not going to cover all of them. Um, <laughs> I tried to pick out a few that you may not know about, a few that are more, uh, more of a problem, um, and some that are just kind of interesting. So uh, this is kind of the outline of what we're going to do. We talk about just the problem, why Florida is such a problem, why it's so easy for us to have an invasive species problem. Um, I'll go into certain types of invasive species, um, a few plants, uh, invertebrates, um, aquatic animals, reptiles or amphibians, mammals. Um, I did leave out birds, that was an accident, but it's invasive species. I can do 17 more lectures on this and still not cover them. So maybe I'll come back and do another one and include birds. Um, and then a little bit about what's being done and how we can help. Um, those are just going to be two quick slides at the end because the uh, number of animals is going to take up the bulk of the presentation. Um, so why is Florida in particular such a hotbed? We have 35 international ports in Florida, which is higher than most other states um, in the US. 120 million tourists every year, um, and that number is ever climbing, and that's also more than most other states. Not, you know, I can't really compare us to California because population-wise and space, they have more of it. 85% of all non-native plants, so plants from all over the world um, that come into the US, come in through Florida. Now there is like agricultural screening and things like that when things come in, but it's not always foolproof and if things are confiscated because they're not allowed to be brought in for one reason or another, the disposal process is also not foolproof. So there is always a chance that an introduction can be made for an invasive species or a problem causing species. Florida has a lot of different climates. We have tropical, subtropical, and temperate climate all within the state. And many of those climates overlap with, the, with similar climates in other parts of the world. So we have a very unique area here that is very receptive to other species from, from different places because we have such a varied climate. So there's a lot of different animals, from not just animals, animals, plants, whatever, from around the world that can find a place in Florida to make a home. This is less than half of the invasive species we have in Florida. This is roughly a little under 250. We have anywhere from 500 to 600 invasive species. I couldn't fit them. <laughs> so. I just was squishing as many as I could onto one slide, just to give you an idea of how you know, mind-boggling it is. So getting into the types of invasive species, there are at least uh, 200 types of plants, I think. Um, I'm going to talk about three of them. Uh, Brazilian pepper trees. These were brought in um, as in the 1800s as an ornamental shrub. People put them in their gardens. They thought they were very pretty, and they are really pretty. They're little brightly colored berries and everything. They're very nice looking. Um, however, they are related to poison oak, poison sumac, and poison ivy. And so for anybody who has a reaction to those plants will likely have a reaction if they touch the leaves of Brazilian pepper. Um, and Brazilian pepper absolutely loves the warm climate here in Florida. And soon after being planted in people's front gardens, it spread like crazy. It now has uh, spread to over 700,000 acres in Florida alone, um, and it continues to spread. You know, there are eradication uh, programs and things in place, but it's, you know, it's very difficult to, to get rid of plants, especially once they start establishing themselves. Um, there are some people that also complain of respiratory problems when the plant is in bloom. So the pollen also can have an effect if you're very sensitive to that kind of thing. Um, they've thrived in our warm climate here. Um, and just the fact that the way that they grow, they are a very, very aggressive species. They can push out native plant species very easily and quickly, and they spread very quickly. Australian pine, I'm sure we're all familiar with that. We have that all over the place. Um, as any of you who have left the Key recently have seen where they just tore down a whole stand of Australian pines right by the tolls. Um, that's been a long time coming. A uh, funny story is in 1992, uh, Bill Baggs got a huge grant from the federal government to do invasive species removal within the park. And Australian pine was the main thing that they were going after. And then soon after they received this grant, Hurricane Andrew hit and wiped out all the Australian pine. 
Um, so the good thing about that was they didn't have to spend the money, you know, to, it's very, very expensive removing these huge trees. But then they could concentrate that money on replanting native species. So Bill Baggs is actually one of the best preserved and um, biodiverse parks in, in the, the state. Um, and they constantly are doing invasive species removal within the park. So they're, they're always trying to stay on top of it to make sure you know, these things don't come back. They have a very shallow root system. Where they grow in Australia, they don't need to have a deep root system because they don't have to deal with hurricanes. Here, they are not made to deal with hurricanes, which is why Hurricane Andrew was so devastating for a lot of the Australian pine. They're shallow, so they get knocked over very easily. So if you have Australian pine growing near your house or your condo, I would say something or try to do something about that because it can fall over and cause damage. Um, they don't support native wildlife. They don't have the food or the shelter that native wildlife has evolved to live in. So when they take over an entire area, that, that pushes out the native wildlife that would normally live there. They also create quite a lot of, they create quite a lot of shade. As you can see down here, it's all black. And that prevents other native plants from growing in because they're not getting sunlight. So they, you know, they just create these huge monoculture stands that's all Australian pine because everything else gets pushed out. The Melaleuca tree. This is one that some, most, a lot of people have not heard of. Also native to Australia, um, once it starts growing in, similar to Australian pine, it will grow in huge monoculture stands like this. And it is extremely dense. Unlike Australian pine, where you can like walk around in here and like go camping probably or something, this is all like, these are within inches of each other. You can't walk around through that. Um, their favorite place to grow is the Everglades. And if you've ever visited the Everglades, you know it is very flat. There are plants that are short. You don't really see a lot of trees. And that is how it has evolved for millennia. And that is what the wildlife that lives in the Everglades is used to and what they need. When you have um, trees that grow in like this and you create a huge stand of trees, that is not only useless to the wildlife that lives there, it's devastating to the flow of the water in the Everglades and it takes away vital habitat to the, the wildlife. Um, the biggest problem with Melaleuca trees is that if you've ever seen them, their bark is very flaky and it peels and it's very dry. And they are a huge culprit to in the increase in wildfires in Florida because they are highly flammable trees. And so wildfires are natural. They do happen on their own occasionally. They are happening more and more often as we have more human influence in a lot of places. California is a good example. But we are having them more often here in Florida and it's, a lot of it is also because we have this non-native um, plant life that has come in and is more susceptible to wildfires. There are a lot more plants. I could go on forever about that, but maybe we'll save that for another lecture if you guys want a part two. Um, invertebrates. I'm just really gonna talk about one, but there are a lot. In, insects is generally what you're talking about when you say invertebrates, but it could mean other things. Um, insects are simultaneously boring and frightening. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it would make for a very interesting lecture on its own, but um, it's, those are really complicated issues, so I'm not going to get into that much. Um, but what I am going to talk about is giant African snails. Not insects, but gastropods, mollusks. Um, they were introduced first in the 1960s and became a huge problem, um, but we spent about a million dollars in the 1960s to eradicate them, which is about ten and a half million dollars now if you, you know, adjust for inflation. Um, they were reintroduced after being eradicated in 2011, and um, they were officially eradicated in Miami and Broward counties. That's where they were introduced to. That's where they were found anyway. Um, so officially eradicated does not mean that they're gone. It just means that the numbers are low enough that they think that they should eventually stop breeding on their own and they'll die out, but they are still being monitored. Um, there are three quarantined areas in Florida. Um, two of them are two other counties. I don't remember what they are, but one of those three areas is still in Broward County. Um, and a quarantine area is basically where they know that there are giant African snails and so there are laws in place to heavily restrict any plant uh, material being moved in and out of those quarantine areas because they don't want to accidentally take a snail out, let it loose somewhere else. The reason they are a huge problem is that they eat 
everything. They eat over 500 species of plants was the number I found, but really they will eat anything that is a plant. If it is under their face, they will eat it. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing, if they can't find enough calcium in their uh, habitat, in their diet, to continue to grow their shells, they will eat stucco off of walls and they will eat the paint off of your car. <laughs> they are a huge nuisance and they grow to massive sizes. Um, they also often uh, carry a rat lungworm, which can cause meningitis in humans. And there are people that eat them and it's, it's very likely that maybe some of them got here because people brought them in as a food source. It's more likely that they came in on vegetation that was brought in like plants and things like that. Um, but in sub-Saharan Africa, where they're from, they are a food source and they're extremely high in protein. Um, and obviously very easy to catch because they're snails. So they're a really good food source in that way. But here in Florida, they do carry the parasite, the rat lungworm, which can be extremely dangerous and, and deadly. Now these are just some idea to give you how large they, to give you an idea how large they are. They are really, really big snails. They're massive. <laughs> So yeah, it's like the size of a rabbit, basically. Um, so yeah, if you, if you see a snail that large, just know that that's not good and you should report that. So just to quickly touch on um, insects, um, we lead the nation in invasive insects that are captured entering uh, the country. And that's usually at the ports where they do environment or um, agricultural inspections and things like that but we have a ton of invasive insects. That's all I'm gonna talk about invertebrates for now. Aquatic species. This is a little bit harder because aquatic species move in and out of the state, um, but there are some very obvious ones, some that most of you will already know. Um, Asian green mussels, you may or may not have heard of. Uh, they are a type of mussel from Asia, obviously. Um, they were brought in in the 1990s, probably through ballast water. Um, ballast water is what large container ships use to balance. So they'll you know, pull into a port, they'll uh, take in water, and it helps balance if their cargo is like not um, even on the boat. So they'll have a lot of water on one side and cargo on the other side, and that balances the boat. Um, and then they can shift it as they move cargo around, things like that, or if they have more or less cargo. So they take in water and release water depending on what's going on on the ship. And the problem with that is that they take in water in one port, say in China, and then they come over here, and then to balance themselves, they release that water. And so then you have like a lot of different types of larval animals that'll be caught in that water and get released in different places all over the world. And that has caused a lot of problems with, with things like mussels. Zebra mussels are another one. Um, we don't really have them here, but in um, the Great Lakes, they're a huge problem. Um, but yeah, so there are a lot of protections in place now and regulations regarding ballast water. Um, I actually had to do a huge report on it a while ago at one of my other jobs. It's super boring, but <laughs> at least we know that they are trying to regulate it to some degree. Um, so they have to treat the ballast water before they release it to make sure that they kill most of what's in it. They are very, very quick to reproduce. And they, they're filter feeders, so anything in the water that is any kind of biological material, they will take that in and then they would grow and reproduce. And the biggest problem that you have with these guys is that nothing here eats them. Uh, so they're finding now that there are some predators that have started eating them, but they've been here so long that they have already become, <coughs> excuse me, become very heavily established. And the, the evolution of the predators here locally is not happening fast enough to, to eat them, to keep them under control. And what you have is these huge like blobs of oyster or of mussels that are attaching to things. They can get heavy enough to sink buoys and they can cause huge problems on ships if, if you're not cleaning your hull properly and they'll cause a lot of drag on your boat. Um, so those are some huge problems. They also grow in stationary things like water inlets and outlets and they will clog up that pipe. So the water that you know power stations take in uh, for cooling purposes or hatcheries need to take in to keep their fish alive to circulate water, those can get clogged up with mussels very quickly. Um, they are eaten in Asia, but they uh, suggest not eating them here because they tend to live in very polluted waters. And they, as I said, they're filter feeders, so they're filtering everything out of the water. So they're likely toxic here, or at least they'll make you kind of sick. Uh, so this is what they look like. They are very green, they're very pretty actually. Lionfish, 
can't talk about invasive species and not talk about lionfish. Uh, most of you probably know about them, so I'm not going to spend too much time. Um, they are endemic to the Indo-Pacific. They are they were first detected in the 1980s. Uh, there have been several different stories about how they got released, um, but chances are it was just either accidental or on purpose, not chances, it was definitely accidental or on purpose uh, released pets. And that's how a lot of things get into the, into the wild, are released pets or escaped pets. Um, but it was definitely, it started in Florida, and that is certain based on the tracking and data that has been collected to show how they've spread throughout the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. It started right around Miami in southern Florida. Um, and we created a huge problem for the entire Caribbean. Um, so they have very few predators, even in their native habitat, because they have these huge spines. You can see them sticking up off the dorsal side, the top side. They have these huge spines that stick out once they're full grown, and they're venomous. So it's, it's, you have to have very specialized predators that can eat them. And here, they don't have any predators. When they're very small and like when tiny babies, they can be eaten by a lot of things. But once they get to a certain stage, then they start producing their venom and their spines get long enough, they become difficult or you know, possibly deadly to eat. So then they don't have any more predators. But just like any tiny little you know, fry, like fish fry that's like this big, that can be eaten by anything. But the bigger problem with that is that they can produce eggs every 20 to 25 days throughout the year. So you can eat as many of those little tiny babies as you want and it will not stop their spread. Um, they eat everything indiscriminately. They will eat other lionfish. Um, I was helping a friend of mine, they were, it wasn't a derby, but they were collecting lionfish for scientific reasons to check their stomachs to see what they had been eating. And more often than not, we would find a really huge lionfish that had a smaller lionfish in its stomach. Um, so they eat each other, they eat shrimp, they eat other fish, they just eat anything that moves that they can get in their mouth, basically. And as I mentioned, they don't have any predators here, so they are causing you know, devastating problems um, in the, the reefs and the surrounding areas. Apparently, I don't eat fish, so I don't know, but I've been told they are delicious. And um, you are allowed to hunt them. Um, there's no bag limit, there's no size limit, there's no time period. You can hunt them if you, if you want. And they do have lionfish derbies where they're just, you know, you get prizes for killing like the most or the biggest or whatever. So I have a couple videos to show you. Armored catfish or Plecostomus. If you guys are familiar with the little algae eaters that people get in their fish tanks, that they're, they're like dark colored and they like stick to the wall, they have the big sucker face. Um, people get those to clean the algae in their fish tanks, but they grow. You buy them when they're like two inches long and they'll just keep growing and growing. And the problem is that people have continued to release them because they get too big for the fish tank. And um, once they get too big, you know, it's a hard decision. Like, do I euthanize a fish or like, what sh what's the best thing to do? And you know, people feel bad. You don't want to euthanize your fish. But at the same time, releasing it into the wild where it doesn't belong is a terrible idea. Um, so I have three videos about this. The second one has sound. It's a news, um, a quick like news thing about it. Um, the sound is off, so they'll like start moving around and talking before the sound starts. I apologize, I don't know how that happened. Um, but this is just to give you an idea of how these things are such a huge problem. And I mean, you can already kind of tell from that picture. So basically what he was doing there is just moving to uh, try to get them off, because they're annoying. Oh, right there. A local professor is now on a mission to save them. The new station's Larry Greenberg reports. Once a month, Dr. Melissa Gibbs jumps into Blue Springs and you can see, see how many of them there are there on the, on the floor. Of the crouching onto the manatee as she can, killing them because they are manatee killers. Watch as this manatee thrashes to get the fish off of it. And they've got these very soft, um, suckery mouths, and so they latch onto the manatees and start grazing the algae off of their skin. Here's what's going on beneath the surface. The manatees are trying so hard to shake these annoying catfish, it causes the manatee to be constantly moving, in turn, burning more calories, which could ultimately lead to the demise of the manatee. They have to go out into the really cold river more frequently, and they're at risk of cold shock, which can kill them. These catfish, just some of the invasive species that feed off Florida's natural habitat, Florida is 
a hot spot for invasive species. It's a real problem that so many things have been brought to Florida and set free. People started buying armored catfish from the Amazon basin to eat the algae in their fish tanks at home. But then they get too big for their fish tanks. A full-sized one can be two feet long. Um, so when they get too big, they release them. Into the wild, where they eat the algae off manatees' backs and grow bigger and bigger. These armored catfish reproduce so much and so fast that these manatees are basically no match for them. Imagine um, 30,000 or more eggs being laid by a single female in a single summer. Dr. Gibbs has speared more than 8,000 armored catfish, but the fact is... We are not going to get rid of the armored catfish, and they are here to stay, unfortunately. But so is Dr. Gibbs. She'll keep hunting the invasive catfish, protecting Florida's beloved manatee, and keeping the always treasured blue springs as beautiful and serene as it deserves to be. They're, uh, they're pretty bad. This is actually another video here, and... Um, I'm not going to play through the whole thing in several minutes, but it just shows you the same thing, how much of a problem that they are in certain areas. So I think most of these uh, videos have been taken in Silver Springs. That's where they're particularly bad. Um, but as they mentioned, they, they irritate the manatees. They stress them out. Um, they cause them to move so they don't get to rest. Um, they, they eat the algae or the plant matter that could be food for other native species. Um, they have very few predators, especially once they reach a large size, because their armored like scales make them difficult to eat. Um, and what they mentioned is the with the nesting habits is that um, basically what the males do is they create these trenches along the bottom that can be up to 18 inches deep, and then they attract a female. The female lays her eggs in these these trenches. Now that could be annoying for a, a number of reasons. One, if you're walking in the shallow water and you step in one, you can break your break your ankle. <laughs> Um, but also, they cause, they are creating a huge erosion problem because they keep destabilizing the, the bottom soil by digging. And especially when you have them in numbers like this, and you have literally thousands upon thousands of nests all next to each other, they're just digging up the entire bottom and destabilizing and, and causing silt and erosion. So, yeah. Huh? I mean, you can do that, but there's, there's so many of them. And as soon as you start, like, you'll see in this video if I let it go, like, they seem like there's, like, a ton of them all together, and you try to, you know, you could just grab them. But as soon as he start, the guy that's taking the video tries to start grabbing them, they move extremely fast. So, yeah, they know you're coming, even though, you know, you could probably go and scoop and catch a couple of them, but, yeah. I don't believe so. I don't think anybody eats them as far as I know. But yeah, see, as soon as you try to catch them, they're suddenly fast. So yeah, and you can imagine, even if, you know, having the algae cleaned off of a manatee's back is not inherently a bad thing. You know, I'm sure an, a, the manatee may or may not prefer to have algae on its back. But you know, if you have a giant, like, two foot long thing just like hanging on your face and like giving, like, giving you a hickey, I mean, sucking the algae off of you. I mean, it's, it's got to be very stressful and irritating. And they don't have hands. They can't brush them away. So there are a lot more fish and aquatic species I could go into. Again, if you guys want, I can come back and do a second invasive species presentation. But we're going to move on to reptiles and amphibians. There we go. Burmese python, everybody's favorite. So recently, there have been two Burmese python sightings on Key Biscayne. Uh, one um, in Bill Bags. I think that one was in the newspaper. It was a year or two ago, I don't remember. Um, and another one that I don't think actually made the news. I heard about it through a friend from a friend. But I did see the picture of it, and that was in Crandon Park. Um, it might even be the same python, to be honest. Um, it looked about the same size, but you never really know. So they have completely established themselves, especially in the Everglades. Um, they are devastating to have because they eat anything that they can fit in their mouth and they can fit very large things in their mouth because like all snakes They can detach their lower jaw and open their mouth to an enormous extent to uh, to fit animals and to, to eat So anything that they can catch small mammals uh, small lizards alligators even if they're large enough um, Sometimes other snakes uh, So they will basically eat anything that they can um, depending on the size, gators will eat them and they will eat gators. So if they are bigger than an alligator, 
they can eat an alligator. If it's a large alligator and it catches a big enough snake that actually is worth eating, they'll eat the snake. So they're kind of, there's a competition for top predator between those two. Um, but the, the snakes can also get to places and get prey that alligators can't, like by climbing trees and things like that. So the snake has a bit of an, of an advantage. Um, Florida will pay you to remove pythons. Um, they have python uh, hunting contests all the time. They have hired snake, expert snake trackers from other countries, like India, to come and hunt uh, pythons to, get, to help get rid of them, because they're such a huge problem. Um, they were, all of them, from originally released or escaped pets. Um, they get huge. They, um, the largest one, the, the heaviest one ever caught in Florida was 245 pounds. The longest one was 19 feet. They were not, those were not the same snake. The, the 19 foot one, I think, was 175 pounds. And then the 245 pound one, I think, was 17 feet. The females will get a lot thicker and fatter than the males, so that's why you have the length and weight difference. Um, but yeah, they can get big enough to eat a toddler. They're, they're huge. Um, and they're, uh, they can get, we haven't found them yet here in Florida, but they can get over 20 feet long in the wild. They have been recorded in Asia at 22 feet. So they are, they are a very uh, prolific and devastating predator to have here. Oh yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. There are some places, um, I don't know if it's Burmese pythons or reticulated pythons, um, but there have been uh, stories of um, human adults being killed by pythons. Um, so yeah, they're, they're a huge problem, obviously. Uh, iguanas I'm not really gonna talk about, I just had to include them because I know that everybody on the key talks about iguanas because they're everywhere. Um, I will say, when I first moved to Florida, and I got the job at the foundation, this is almost eight years ago now. I was parking, we used to, our building used to be right across the street in Village Hall. And I would always park in the street under those trees, right next to the uh, Paradise Park. And every day I would come out to my car and something huge had clearly pooped on my car. And, and I'm just like, what is like up there? There's, it's a small tree, like what could possibly be up there? And I'm just like, did a pelican fly over my car? Because like this, it must be a huge bird, right? Like I had no idea. It took me like six months to figure out that there are actually these huge iguanas. I mean, I, I'd seen the iguanas, but I hadn't seen them in the trees. So I didn't realize that they would climb trees and poop on your car all the time. <laughs> and yeah, so obviously that's a huge problem with them. They also, the green ones are, tend to be more herbivorous, so they eat plants. Um, occasionally you might catch them eating bird's eggs or something like that, but for the most part the green ones eat plants. But we also have, um, if you see the large ones that are more grayish brown in color and have more sort of severe looking spikes on their back, those are spiny tailed or Mexican iguanas. And those are omnivorous, so they will eat bird's eggs, they will eat uh, small lizards, small animals, anything that they can catch. And they may also, and insects obviously, um, they may also, or will also eat uh, plants. But the biggest problem is that they are taking up an area in the ecosystem that is supposed to be occupied by native species. And they're so big and so prolific that they're pushing all these native species out. Um, another one that I didn't include here that we see everywhere and a lot of people don't realize are not native are the little brown anoles that you see running around on the ground all the time. Those are actually from, their, from the Caribbean and they were brought in on plants and you know, random shipments of fruits and things like that. Um, and they have displaced our native green anoles, which you see up in the trees. The green anoles used to be on the ground and in the trees, but now they've become predominantly arboreal, meaning living in the trees, because these little brown ones have displaced their niche on, on the ground. No native iguanas. Every iguana you see in Florida is introduced. We do have a lot of lizards, but no, no iguanas. Uh, most of the anoles, there's also night anoles, which are bigger. Um, they're not native. Uh, we have a lot of um, uh, geckos are not native. We have geckos everywhere. Cane toads. Cane toads are a problem actually all over the world. Um, you may have heard stories of um, Australia where cane toads have been introduced. The same here, cane toads have been introduced to control pests like cane beetles. We are, they were originally introduced to control cane beetles that were devastating the sugar cane 
And uh, that original population actually died out. And then they, they were reintroduced in the 1950s. They were released either on purpose or by accident um, at near the Miami airport by a pet importer. Um, my guess it was on purpose. He probably got caught with a shipment he wasn't supposed to have. So his, he's like, well, if you don't have any evidence, I can't get in trouble and release them. Um, so clearly you can see they get massive. They can get huge. They, and they also eat things indiscriminately. They will eat anything small that they can fit in their mouth. They'll eat snakes. Um, they'll, eat other, uh, they'll eat birds. They'll eat other toads and frogs. Um, and the biggest problem with them is that they're toxic. So, and, and pets, dogs tend to be the biggest victims. They'll see one, it's moving around, they're interested and curious. They'll sniff it or bite it or lick it and uh, their toxins can cause seizures and can be deadly. And so that's one of the biggest problems that you have with cane toads. So they're, they're a huge issue and they don't actually, you know, because they eat everything, they don't just eat the uh, bugs that they were introduced to eat. Um, and then, you know, because they don't, they don't really have any predators here because nothing can eat them because they're toxic, so they just can breed indiscriminately. I, oh, yes, thank you. Chameleons, that's what I was thinking of earlier. <laughs> um, but yeah, and it's, I, I, I find that I'm using the words like prolific and indiscriminate quite a lot in this presentation, but that is what makes something invasive, is that if it can reach these levels where it's breeding on its own and it's spreading, and causing problems, that's, that's why they're invasive and not just non-native. Tegus are another uh, lizard species that are becoming a larger and larger problem in Florida. There are a few neighborhoods around somewhere in central Florida that have uh, breeding populations of tegus. They look like monitor lizards, but that's actually just what we call convergent ev evolution. Um, they evolved in a similar uh, environment to different types of monitor lizards, so they look similar. But they're not actually monitor lizards. They are, um, however, large. Um, they can get up to four feet long and quite heavy. Uh, they are all definitely released pets or escaped pets. Um, they actually make very good pets, apparently. Um, they can be very docile, very calm as pets. Um, they, uh, they're very strong. They have, their jaws are strong enough to take off a finger. Uh, so you don't really, if you see one, don't assume that it's somebody's pet and it's going to be docile. Uh, they aren't, they usually run away from people, but again, they can be, you know, they can cause a lot of damage. But, so that gives you a, an idea of not only the size, but how, like, docile they can be with people. And that is a very fat tegu. Um, oh, and like I said, I mean, I did mention several other types of lizards. We can go on about lizards and... Um, Amphibians, Cuban tree frogs, that's another big one. They're everywhere. Um, we can go on about that forever, too. So feral hogs. Um, you don't see them very often around here, but they are found in all 67 counties in Florida. Um, they do have preferred habitat. Um, particularly, they prefer oak, cabbage, um, palm, like hammocks. They like freshwater marshes, pine flatwoods, and agricultural areas. Um, but they will live anywhere. If they, if they need to move on to a different place, they, they will. Um, they, they're huge. I have the, up to 200 pounds or more than 200 pounds. There was a hog that was killed, uh, I think a year or two ago, that was 400 pounds. Um, they were introduced in the 1500s by Spanish conquistadors and have since been uh, mixing with uh, domesticated pigs that have escaped. You know, Europeans brought over domesticated pigs when the area was being settled. Sometimes they escape. And so they have a, they're extremely hardy because they have this like sort of hybrid uh, domestic and wild uh, pig blood essentially, like pig genes. Um, so they're very, very hardy. They're very resilient. Um, and they can also devastate the ecosystem. There aren't really, you know, predators large enough. I mean, the Florida panther would probably hunt them. But they live in large family groups, and the adults will defend the babies very, like, very harshly. And so unless a Florida panther were to find one on its own or find a baby that has wandered off, they're not likely to attack a family group. So they don't really have predators either. Um, and yeah, they're, they, th this is the kind of problems that they cause. They, they root around in the dirt looking for food. They like to eat roots and bugs and worms and things like that. Um, they eat a lot of vegetation. 
And so a family group will come through and root through your front yard and do this. Um, and it's a huge problem, not just for homeowners, um, but also for wildlife, because they destroy the habitat by doing this. Uh, I, they might get teeth that are a little bit large, but they don't get the, the whole, um, whole, like, the, the tusks, yeah. So feral cats, these aren't feral, clearly. Um, I added the cats in. I know that might make some people upset because they don't like to think of cats as, as a problem, but they are actually invasive. They're, there are no cats that are native to North America, and um, they are everywhere, clearly. You know, These are my cats. <laughs> They are harmless, they don't go outside, and they're also really dumb. So they're very sweet, but they don't even kill bugs. Um, however, cats in general, um, outdoor cats, feral cats, indoor outdoor cats, and feral cats, e even if you have an indoor outdoor cat that is regularly fed, it will still, it retains the instinct to hunt and kill. And it will do it, maybe less often than a completely feral cat, but it will still do it. And there have been studies that showed that um, the cats throughout the country within a year will kill up to 1.4 billion small birds and, and mammals. Uh, so it ha they have had a, quite a devastating effect on a lot of different species of birds and mammals uh, throughout the country and of course obviously here in Florida where we already have a lot of other things in here causing problems. So it's just something to think about. I am not anti-cat, clearly. Um, I love cats, but you know, if you have one, it may be a better idea to keep it inside if you're worried about the environment. And finally, monkeys. Monkeys are fun. I figured I'd end on a, on a silly note. Um, there have been three different species of monkeys living in Florida. Um, the first one are the rhesus macaques. They were originally introduced. Um, OK, actually, before I get into that, how many people think that they were introduced because of uh, biomedical research? How many people think they, people had them as pets and released them? How many people think that they were escaped from a zoo or from a circus or something like that? Right. So in their case, it wasn't anything like that, any of those things. There was a, river go a riverboat captain in Silver Spring named Captain Tui, and he gave tours around Silver Springs. And to increase his um, tourist sites, basically, he got a hold of six rhesus monkeys and released them on an island in the river, thinking that, oh, well, let me take you to the monkey island and show you the monkeys. And you know, in his defense, probably 80 to 85% of ape and monkey species don't swim. So it seemed like a safe bet. Um, rhesus monkeys love to swim, and they are excellent swimmers. So he released six of them, and they left immediately um, into the surrounding forest and uh, surrounding area and started to breed. He, for whatever reason, I don't know if he thought they died or didn't realize they escaped, thought, let me try again. So he released six more, and the exact same thing happened. Thankfully, he didn't try again, but the damage was already done. 12 monkeys is well, like, definitely enough to start a population. Um, and they just started breeding like crazy. And they eat, you know, anything that they can, they eat a lot of fruits and, and vegetables and leaves and, and vegetation, but they will also eat bird's eggs and small animals if they can catch them. And um, <clears throat> what researchers are most concerned about is that they're probably most devastating to nesting birds. Excuse me. Um, but, for people, one of the biggest problems with rhesus macaques is that they uh, carry the herpes B virus, which can be deadly for humans. So if you get bitten or something like that, and you know, people will go up and try to feed them and like be friendly because they're, they're monkeys and they're cute. You kind of you know you want to, um, but you know it's it's very very dangerous. They started um, so that was in the 1960s when they were first released. I think it was the 1960s. Um, they, they started a program to, they allowed people, private uh, trappers, to trap them, and they were being sold into biomedical research. That was very controversial. People didn't like it, so eventually they stopped that program. They tried culling, but that also was very controversial. 
people don't like the idea of you just you know killing a bunch of monkeys. Um, so now they have, a, or I don't know if they still do, but they had a program where uh, they were catching them and sterilizing them and releasing them. And so it's basically a trap, neuter, release program, just like we do with cats. And that was more acceptable. And uh, they had a population that was over 400 at some point. It was brought down to 175. Um, but a second population has popped up nearby. And there's probably in the neighborhood of 200 to 250 individuals. They don't have an accurate count, so they're not sure. Um, but these monkeys, of all the ones I'm going to talk about, are the ones that are the biggest problem for the reasons I outlined. Vervet monkeys. There is a very small, stable population of vervet monkeys in Miami-Dade County. I don't know where, um, but somewhere. You can probably Google it. They, um, oh, I forgot to mention, um, rhesus monkeys are from Asia. They have the largest range of any monkey species on Earth. They, they span all the way from Afghanistan to uh, eastern China. Vervet monkeys are um, from Africa. They actually were escaped from a biomedical research lab. And uh, there is a small population somewhere that's about 35. It has fluctuated. They, they escaped in the 80s. And their population has stayed very, very steadily at 35 to 45 individuals. And it has not wavered from that range. And so they have created their own little niche. They don't seem to be, I mean, they're being studied. They don't seem to be causing any harm. They haven't created, like, you know, blown up out of proportion, like in their population, the way the rhesus monkeys continue to uh, increase their population. And, and they just seem like a very small, stable population. So they're not actually invasive. They're just a non-native breeding population. Um, I just included them because I was talking about monkeys. Um, but yeah, and they seem to keep to themselves. They don't really seem to cause a lot of problems. They also don't carry, as far as we know, any viruses or diseases that we can get. But there's always that potential, which is you know worrisome. Squirrel monkeys, they're very small, and they're very cute, and very highly desirable in the pet industry. They were um, originally released, two breeding pairs were released, and the details on this are very vague. A social club in Fort Lauderdale released two breeding pairs. Why, I have no idea. Nothing that I could find said why they did it. Um, or how, or you know, anything. Why they even had monkeys to begin with, or what type of social club it is. It just said social club. So, but that's how we know that they got released in Fort Lauderdale. And by the way, there were other. There have been other populations of monkeys in different areas and in the Keys. I'm just not going over them because they don't exist anymore. These are just the current ones. So, um, so these were released, and they started breeding, and they had a population that got, I think, up as much as like maybe 75 at one point. Um, near Fort, it was around Fort Lauderdale. They have been constantly monitored, but also constantly trapped, as I said, because they're very highly desirable in the pet industry. So there was, you know, there's not really laws about monkeys in Florida, so there was nobody stopping the, the trapping. And at some point, I think they tried to pass something that would, you know, stem people trapping them, but that didn't get passed, and you know, it just wasn't like a big enough priority for anybody to do anything. Um, they also think that whenever there was a slightly cold winter, they didn't handle that well. They're from South America. They're used to very tropical environments. And so as of 2021, I believe, there was one individual left from that population, and they haven't seen him since. So as far as we know, they may be gone. Or they may have moved in, they didn't realize it, but it seems as though they're gone now. And finally, crab-eating macaques they are possible. And the reason I say that, there was a study done ju just last year that looked at 460 possible invasive species that could invade Florida. And they did a lot of research trying to determine you know, how animals arrive, what, what is causing them to be invasive, like why they can become invasive. So they looked at, the likely, the, as I said, the likeliness that they can arrive um, the likeliness that they could spread and establish, and then how severe that would be um, impacting the surrounding environment. And as I said, they looked at 460 potential animals that could be invasive, and of that, 40 of them were assessed to be potential invasive animals. So those are the 40 to watch, you know, and make sure like they're very heavily controlled with their importing and things like that. 
And number four on the list, which surprised everybody on the research team, was crab-eating macaques. And it seems really weird. Like, how is a monkey so high on an invasive species list unless somebody is deliberately like, trying to bring them, like the rhesus macaques? And it's because there are three biomedical facilities in Florida that keep and breed crab-eating macaques. And they have them numbering in the thousands. And so one good hurricane coming through and damaging one of those facilities could release hundreds of these um, monkeys into the environment. And so, you know, or just, you know, an animal rights activist with, you know, a kind of skewed sense of like what's right and what's wrong goes in there and releases a bunch. Who knows? You know, there's any, any number of reasons that they could escape. As we know, the vervet monkeys escape from a biomedical facility. It's possible. So that's why they're so high on the list. Uh, uh, they are, uh, they're also from Asia. I'm not sure exactly where. They're very closely related to the rhesus macaques. And that's the other reason that it's concerning is because they're closely enough related that they could also carry potential viruses like the herpes B virus or something else that could be a problem for humans. So it's an interesting study. I haven't read through the whole thing yet, but um, the other things were, thing, were uh, animals that were more obvious like fish and there's some kind of like crawfish and uh, Oh, zebra mussels were like number two on the list. So quickly, what's being done? It's unlawful to release any animal that is not native to Florida. Um, you're just not allowed to do it unless you have a specific like permit or something and, or you're doing research. Or, you, know, you have to have very, very specific reasoning for doing it. You're not supposed to do it. Um, and if you get caught doing it, you can get in serious trouble. Um, species that are designated as invasive or non-native are very heavily controlled. Burmese pythons are no longer allowed to be bought, sold, or imported to Florida. Uh, same with lionfish. Uh, there's a lot of species like that in the pet trade that are no longer allowed in Florida. So you have to go some very roundabout illegal way if you want one as a pet. And then things like Burmese pythons, lionfish, feral hogs, and several of the other animals, you're just allowed to hunt them indiscriminately. All, the only thing that you can't do, same with iguanas actually, what you can't do is torture them. Um, there was some guy that caught a bunch of iguanas recently and he got in trouble because he wasn't humanely killing them. He was doing something else. I don't want to get into that. But, but obviously you, like, you can't torture them, but you can kill them and hunt them as much as you want. And there's no size limit. There's no bag limit. Um, there's no hunting season. And so that's one way that you know, when it comes to at least the invasive species, you can try. But it is a very, very difficult problem. It's a very expensive problem for the government to deal with. And then, of course, the most obvious thing, what can you do? Don't release your pets. You know? <laughs> you keep very careful track of them. You know, just don't use common sense, basically. You know? um, otherwise, you can, if you see something that is clearly invasive or, um, or non-native, you can report it. And this is the phone number. It's 188-I've got one. So that's 1-888-483-4681. And you can report any invasive species or non-native species that you see. And they especially want to hear about the problem, the big problem ones, like Burmese pythons and things like that. I would suggest not calling them about iguanas, because they know. And <laughs> iguanas are less of a problem, because they're not so dangerous to humans. They're just annoying. Whereas uh, the Burmese pythons are more devastating in like, the ecologically protected areas like the Everglades. Um, and a big one could eat a toddler. So, you know, there's that. So, any questions? Yes. Okay. Well, let me do one, and then I'll go to somebody else and come back. <laughs> the African snails are not dangerous. Yeah. So, so the African snail. She was asking if they're dangerous to touch. They're not. Um, you saw that the picture of that woman like holding one. Um, they're they're not dangerous to touch. They're just like any other snail. They're not really going to do anything to you. They're just huge, and they're just a problem species because of what they eat. Um, and if you're going to eat a snail, that might be a problem for you, but obviously don't eat the snail. You, you can catch them, yeah, the, those snails. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so this number that I just had, that's the number to report anything. If you see an invasive species, that's the best number to call. If you don't have that, just Google Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, and they'll direct you where to. There is also an app. That's called I've Got One, and you can report it on the app as well. Now, just because you report it does not mean that they'll necessarily come out immediately and take it. Um, and with lionfish, you know, things like lionfish, it might be impossible because they swim away and you can't find them. 
Um, and same with any of these animals, they may leave the area, but it's important for them to know where they are and if they're getting multiple reports in the same area, then they'll know like, hey, that's a target area that we need to look at more closely and then they can you know, plan accordingly in that, that, that kind of situation. So, so if you're reporting it, it's, it's important for their data, but don't assume necessarily that they're gonna come get it. Unless you like find a Burmese python in your toilet or something, then I'm sure they'll do something about it. Um, another question, I saw somebody, oh yeah. Yeah, um, I, I couldn't say for sure. Um, parrots are also not native. There used to be one parrot species that was native to North America. It is now extinct. So every single parrot you see here is not native to North America. As far as where they are, I couldn't say for sure. Um, they might be annoyed by sounds and they move on. Um, it could be cats, you know, it could be anything. I, I don't know, I, I wouldn't know why they, they leave. Um, probably not, because most of the parrots here require a warm temperature. So unless they're, and as far as I know, most parrots don't really travel long distances. They're not really built for that. Um, I, I can't say that for all of them, I don't know for sure. But they, they might migrate within a certain area, but not long distances. Um, so catching one, the, the best way to catch lionfish is spearing them. Because they tend to be very slow moving and they will not, they don't usually escape a spear if you're, if you're any good at that. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, they don't, yeah, they're not scared of anything because they don't have predators. Um, and yeah, and then it's just really a matter of like, they're not dangerous to touch as long as you don't stab yourself on one of the spines that are on their back. And so when you're filleting them, you just have to be careful not to cut the venom sacs that are at the base of the spine. But it's not that difficult. That I've actually done before. Um, I've cut open several lionfish. It's very easy to fillet them once you catch them. It's just a matter of being careful how you handle them. You can hold a lionfish and it's not gonna do anything to you. It's only if you stab yourself on it. So it's just a matter of just being careful. They do those every year. They're called lionfish derbies. And yeah, they have lionfish derbies every year, um, usually around the same place. I think they tend to do them in Miami Beach now. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you just were to like Google lionfish derby, you'll find one immediately and they'll tell you the dates and everything and when it's happening. And you know, they're a great way to like catch lionfish and encourage people to eat them because they do fish fries usually afterwards, um, you know, to show people. I've been told that they taste like chicken. I, I don't know. I find that very hard to believe because I hate fish, but, but I like chicken. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are actually a surprising number of people that will eat iguana meat. Um, there was a story probably two or three years ago. Um, it was one of the winters where we had a very, very cold couple days. And you know, they warn you of falling iguanas because when it gets very cold, um, the iguanas, they don't die, but they get cold shocked and they can't move. They, they're, war they're cold blooded, so they need heat in order to metabolize their, their food and everything. So when it gets cold, they can't move. So they will literally freeze and fall out of a tree. Um, and this guy was going around collecting iguanas specifically to eat them and didn't realize, he assumed that they were dead. And he didn't realize when he put them in his car where the heat was on that they came back to life. He ended up crashing his car because he got attacked by iguanas in his car. Um, so, you know, you're you know, absolutely more than welcome to eat iguanas but use a little common sense with it. <laughs> Just be careful. Um, and iguanas, like, you know, they're just like any other wild animal, like, they'll bite you. They can whip you with their tail, which is quite painful. Um, it's one of their defense mechanisms. But, um, but otherwise, you know, most of the time, they're just trying to get away. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it.